This show is brought to you by The North Face. Now, The North Face have been my sponsors for the last eight or nine years, and I'm really proud to be involved with this fantastic outdoor brand. Now, they've been in the outdoor industry for over 50 years, and they're the premier supplier of authentic, innovative, and technologically advanced exploration apparel. For your footwear, equipment, accessories, they've got the best stuff. Now, their lightweight and weather-resistant flight series running gear is my absolute favorite. So if you're into trail running, if you're into desert running, if you're into just exploring our mountains, then these, this is the go-to gear. And it's designed to endure, engineered to help you through the heat, through heavy downpours, or whatever else comes your way so that you can run no matter what, every day, any weather, any terrain, and never stop exploring. If you'd like to check out their whole range, go to thenorthface.co.nz. <laughs> Welcome, Welcome to Pushing the Limits, the podcast that gets deep into the psyche of extraordinary achievers across all genres, cutting to the chase to unlock the secrets of their success, their achievement, philosophies, and motivations. Join us in the quest to find out what makes the movers and shakers of our world tick and what gems and wisdom we can learn from them. Now, over to your host, Lisa Tamati. Well, hi, everybody. It's Lisa Tamati here at Pushing the Limits. Thank you so much for joining me once again today. I really appreciate your loyalty and, and having you back every week to, to listen to all the amazing people that I, that I get on the show. It's always a real privilege for me to have insights into different areas and different people's lives. And today is no exception. I've got a, a, a very exciting and wonderful gentleman who's had a, a crazy life. And um, he's going to share a little bit of his story today. So we've got Paul Pritchard with us all the way from Tasmania at the moment. I believe you're sitting in Tasmania. Is that right, Paul? It is, yes. Yep. It's raining outside. Uh, it is here too, mate. It is here as well. It's not very nice here. We've had a cyclone in the last couple of days. But um, So, Paul, you're originally, though, from the UK. Is that right? Yeah, I'm originally from from close to Manchester, and mm-hmm. then I spent 20 years in 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 North Wales. Yep. And then I've been here for 16 years in in, in Tasmania. Wow. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of background on Paul's story for the listeners out there. Paul was an extreme top level, one of the world's best climbers uh, back in the the 90s. Would have been, wouldn't it, uh, uh, Paul? Um, and had many major climbs to his name when a terrible accident struck. So let's start the story there, Paul. Let's go back to your early days and um, what were some of your your highlights in your early years as a climber and how did you get into climbing for a start? Well, a teacher started me climbing when I was 15 in, in, um, in, in Manchester. Mm-hmm. And... It was the first time that I was ever good at anything, and <laughs> and, and so I, I just ran with it. And by by kind of age eighteen, that was all I ever did. I was just totally fascinated by climbing. Did it every day. Um, I wouldn't say that I would became professional, but I, by by well, it was in the Thatcher Thatcher era when there was four million people unemployed. So I yeah. would. So it was, um, I was one of those, and I went climbing every day. So that's yeah. professional. Eh? <laughs> yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure someone paid you ten dollars, so we'll call you a professional uh, rock climber because there wasn't much else happening back then, was there? And that that uh, state of affairs. So this was something that you were obviously very talented at, and you became extremely. Um, you know, you did some extreme climbs in those early years. Uh, run me through a few of the, you know, uh, your sort of highlights of your, your early career there. Yeah, so I soon moved to Wales and the kind of epicenter of, of rock climbing in in the UK, Slambaris, and I and I um, and I started climbing kind of the top grade of the time there, and but in. And then in 1990, I, I started to pursue um, big wall climbing and mountaineering rather than the, the, the small outcrops of, right. of, um, of, of, of 
of Wales and um, and some of my major kind of climbs there. I went to Mount Asgard on Baffin Island and did the first ascent of the west face of that and um, and and Trango Tower in Pakistan and um, wow and and I guess what what differentiated me I was never really interested in in plodding up eight, or, or climbing 8,000 meter peaks which might be mm -hmm. technically easier yep I was into a push I, I took my rock climbing and put it to kind of kilometer plus high walls wow um, a bit like well, like El Capitan in Yosemite Valley, you might have, yes, you might have seen. Yes, yes, I've watched so, a number of docos on that. Yep. Yeah. So a bit like that. Well, exactly like that, but in 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 the mountain ranges. Wow. I mean, for me, I mean, I'm so fascinated by this. I mean, I remember in my early twenties just reading rock climbing books and mount and mountaineering books and and people you know in the Himalayas and people like Reinhold Messner and and things like that yeah. and just being totally in awe of of what they could do and, and, and never contemplating that I could ever do that type of thing because I, I wasn't <laughs> I wasn't uh, that way inclined but just being totally impressed at the um, at the especially in the free climbing scene and, and um, you know the, the the challenges that people undertook I remember being fascinated by the Eiger North North Nordwand um, yeah and reading lots and lots of books on that one yeah. Um, so I have, I've never done it, so I can't relate to it in that way, but I can in, in a, as, as a fan of, of people who do this sort of thing. Um, yeah. So what goes through your mind as a climber when you're in these horrifically dangerous, I mean, let's be honest, they're not, you know, they're dangerous situations, and you're in the middle of a war. How do you not get to a point where you're just freaking out and you can't find the next handhold to get up the next, the next level? And you can't go well, forward, and you can't go backwards. You know, how the hell do you get over there? And you're, you're thousands of feet up, or hundreds of feet up. Well, you must know yourself. But it kind of, it takes a lot of a lot of training and a lot of, a lot of mental training to get to get to that place. So first of all, you 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 start off on easy climbs. Um, but the thing is about rock climbing, and it's probably the same with with, with um, ultra marathons, and um, it's a bit like yoga. Yeah. I mean, in in terms of in terms of what, well, in rock climbing, you got to hold these positions for right. like like yoga poses for for minutes at a time, really wow. strenuous positions. Um, and as soon as you step off the ground, really, you 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 you're facing some kind of injury and risk. Yeah. And so it it is. It's exactly. It's just extreme yoga that you force that you force yourself into. I guess by by yeah. putting yourself there. That's a really interesting analogy. I've never thought of it like that. But you you're totally right. To be able to hold under tension your body in yeah. the most bizarre of poses, basically, or, or holding yeah. on to a rock face like this, going, where the hell am I going next? It is a bit like well, extreme yoga, isn't it? Um, but a hell of a lot more riskier, I'd say. <laughs> well, when you do that day in, day out, day in, day out, it's like mind training then. So yeah. you, you, get, you just get, you get so good at it that, that, that you, it means that you – you can weigh up situations and, and you can make it so that you're not freaked out by these by these situations. And so it's, it's an incremental thing that, you, in other words, that you didn't you know wake up one day and go, right, I'm going to climb some crazy wall somewhere and just head off and do it. This is years and years of daily, daily practice to get. So from a 15-year-old boy right through to a, a young man, that's how long it does take that, what, five, six, seven, ten years to get to a level of, of really massive. Exactly, yeah. 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 And we, we of course, you know, as outsiders look at it and just go, rah, that's freaky. You know, how, how the hell? <laughs> it's freaky. Yeah. You know? How on earth can you get there? And I mean, yeah, like you say, there's a little bit of an analogy alongside the ultra running thing. You know, people like, I can hardly run 5Ks. How the hell do you run 200 or, you know, 300K? And it's like, well, yeah. you, you know, you just go one step further all the time you, know? exactly, yeah. you, lift, you lift your horizon yeah. just that little weeny bit but yeah 
so you did this for a number of obviously for quite a long time and then in in 1998 you had a major major accident so let, let's talk about this life-changing event and, and that's still you know um is a major part of your life today what happened there so tell the tell the listeners about your horrific <coughs> well accident me and my me and my then girlfriend um Ron Holiday in Tasmania. It's a kind of round the world climbing trip, really. Um, I just won this book prize for 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 my for my first my first book uh, climbing book, and and I spent the money on this round the world ticket. As you do. Uh, <laughs> and we found ourselves at the totem pole, which which. Uh, is the most slender sea stack we call them in in the world it's four meters wide by 65 meters high wow and it sways when you when you in the wind when you stood on top of it it's so delicate wow so it's like um, a needle isn't it i mean i've seen pictures of yeah. it in tes in, on, yeah. uh, on the coast of tasmania somewhere and so instead of being a singular mountain wall that you're climbing up this is a like a, a needle of rock that you, Stick, you yeah, set your sights on. Sea. Yeah, and it's a yeah, it's a very um, sexy piece of rock, isn't it? <laughs> it is, yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, in fact, my my publisher told me that I I couldn't have had a, a, a more a life altering accident on a more sexy piece of rock if <laughs> I tried. Yeah. yeah, totally. Yeah, it is. A, it's a pretty freaky, cool thing cool place to do it if you're going to do one you know <laughs> so what happened on that rock on that day what what can you well, remember so i was right at the base of the of the of the of the, of the needle um um celia my 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 then girlfriend was 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 up above me she's she was she's a very very competent climber mm -hmm. too, and um, and and I was I just set off to to climb up to her when a, when a a rock about as big as a as a concrete building block fell fell on my head. Oh wow! So a huge um, chunk just fell out of the wall from from 25 meters up wow and and it it crushed my skull and and, and put a 10 centimeter by two and a half centimeter hole in my skull and um Shit. and i was there then hanging upside down on the rope with um about a meter off the sea with with, with blood pouring into the sea from my head and um, Celia had to upsell down to me, get me upright in, in slings. She put her helmet on me. I wasn't wearing a helmet. Um, and then she climbed back up to the ledge, up the rope. And then she hauled me up the up up to the ledge some um, thirty meters. Holy heck! It took, it took three hours. Oh my god! To haul, to haul me up to the to haul me up to this ledge, but then this ledge is like this sofa-sized ledge, halfway up a needle of rock. Oh my gosh! What what a what a strong woman she must be! Like, how the hell Absolutely. do you do that? Yeah, um, yeah. So she was used to. She was used to hauling bag, bags up El Capitan in Yosemite Valley. Yep. Um, we climbed it together. Um, and and so she was used to kind of hauling bags, heavy bags up. And so that's where she learned how to do that. Wow. Um, with pulley, a pulley system. Yeah, yeah. Um, but... So you you were on the end of this rope for three hours before you even got to the ledge, just being yeah. Pulled. Were you yeah. conscious or, or semi conscious at this stage? Kind of. I remember I remember hearing her as I got to the edge of the ledge. 
the ropes kind of going over the ledge and the corner of the ledge and, and she couldn't move me. And so I remember her screaming at me saying, you've got to help me here if we're going to get you out of this. Yep. And, um, and that's the first time that I realised that I'd done something really hellish really? to myself. I yeah. Couldn't, I couldn't, I could, totally couldn't move my right arm and right leg. They yep. were just like wood. So that part of the brain had been killed off basically or, or at least, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, a, like a massive stroke type thing to that part of the brain. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So your um, skull was open, like your brain was literally hanging out. Hanging out. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and how the hell did you get off the ledge though? Once she got you up to that that level. Yeah. So then she put me on the ledge and made me safe. Put me in the recovery position. Yep. Then she climbed up to the top of the totem pole. There's a rope up there. Um, and then there was. And then there's a rope linking the top of the totem pole to the mainland, which yep. was, which was um, in situ. It was already there by some people that were a previous some Welsh people actually mm -hmm. that were filming, uh, mm. but they were but they weren't they weren't there that day. We were all on our own. So she went back across the across the Tyrolean traverse. It's called this kind of like a, a, a horizontal rope traverse in space yes then when she got back to the headland she looked back at me and she thought oh this is the last time i'm ever going to see him alive you know yeah Far out. Uh, yeah. and then she had to run eight kilometers for help oh gosh over 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 hills and through forest um it's at the end of cape hoy if um on the tasman peninsula if anybody yeah. wants to Yep. Check it out. A long way um, from nowhere, by the sounds. Yeah, yeah. and and um, and after after seven further hours. <sighs> so I've been on that ledge ten hours when when Holy when when, risk, when when I when somebody I've sailed down to me um, a, a paramedic I've sailed down to me. And um, made me safe. Well, he put a neck brace on me, clipped me to his harness, and abseiled down the down the totem pole again. Oh crikey! To, yeah. So not even wait. a helicopter or or anything like that. Just just abseiling down. Yeah. The problem with a helicopter is that it's in this such a narrow and space. It's it's 65 meters high, but it's enclosed by 120 meter high right, cliffs. Right, right. So there is no way. I think there probably is a way to. I think now winch lines are longer, and so you, we could have got out by winch now. But but back then, winch line wasn't long enough. Yep. So this crazy person had to to get across to the totem pole. Yeah. Abseil down to you, and then yeah. abseil with you down that thirty meters back down to the ocean, yeah. back down to the the rocks, which I imagine were the sea, and you know, uh, getting you yeah, getting an injured person he across. Sailed, yeah, you had to have sailed down into a into a, a waiting tinny that was acting as a lifeboat, right? Just a, just just a just a tin boat. Yeah. Um, Neil Smith, he was called the guy that. That rescued me. We're still friends. Wow. Um, so the, the the lifeboat was going up and down by by two meters on the swell. Oh man! Yeah, I can uh, imagine. Against, yeah. Against, against the 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 totem pole itself. So. So he was putting his lifeline uh, on the line too. Yeah. So what happened was that when the boat was on the upsurge against the wall, he cut the rope. And both of us fell into fell into the boat. Oh, because he knew that there was just no time to lose. I'd already yeah. lost half my blood. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. Half I mean, of I, your blood. So you were still a lot. You know, like you were still conscious yeah. all this time, or, or semi sort of conscious. Semi conscious. Yeah. And but he thought when he when he was approaching me, he thought that it was just a simple corpse recovery, judging by the amount of blood on the ledge. Yeah. Yeah. That you were still alive <laughs> and cooking, yeah, 
And and yeah. So they got you back to the hospital in Tasmania uh, originally. So you spent, uh, I believe, a month in there in, in an acute state of, yeah, critical, basically critical care with massive yeah, brain injury. Yes. I think it was six weeks in there. Yep. I only, it was five days in an induced coma. Yep. Um, and... And then, uh, and then they stabilised me enough that I, I could then, I could then be medevaced home back to back to Wales. Yep. Yeah. Where, where I spent a year in a rehab centre. An entire year getting. And yeah. when you uh, got back to the UK, and now you're, you're you're stable, you're going to live, but you've got massive brain injuries, um, and and therefore physical impairments. So now you've got hemop. Plegia, so that is on completely on the right side. Is that leg yeah. and arm, the whole right yeah. side? Yep. What um, other what uh, other sort of uh, you, you had massive memory loss and, and things like that as well? Yeah, I couldn't talk for months. Wow. Um, I was epileptic. Well, I still am epileptic since then. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it was just like being a baby again as well. Yes. You know, I couldn't talk. Couldn't sit up, couldn't for, for ages. Um, I couldn't feed myself or dress myself or anything yep. like that. You know, um, totally. So they were, so they would only let me out of the rehab centre once. At once, I could prove to them that that I could take care of myself, and that was about a year down the road. Wow. Like, uh, yeah. Uh, amazing yeah. that you have a, a facility though that, that would you know take care of you for for that long. <laughs> so th- yeah. It, so you were a fit young man, like an extremely fit young man, and now you're faced with being in in you know like seriously severely um, disabled, and you're you're obviously looking at a very different life at this stage. How yeah. did you how did you find the 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 will to get better, or to carry on, to fight through, to do all the amazing things that you've done since. And this is the reason why I've got Paul on the show, because he's, he's had an incredible life since the accident. I mean, what you did before the accident was, was mind-blowing, but what you've done literally, <laughs> literally what you've done since the accident is, is nothing short of... It, it shows the, the stamina and, the, and the, what the human body and, and mind is capable of doing despite massive injury um, mm. and the human spirit above all. Um, so how did you not just give up in that time where you were like, oh, that's, that's <coughs> me done. I'm never going to climb again. I'm never going to be completely able-bodied again. Well, I thought about it. You know, like, uh, I, I moved once he let me out after a year. In, in, um, I was still in a wheelchair um, I bought I bought a house that was on the level and and was um, about thirty meters from the local cafe and so I just used to spend <laughs> loads loads of time in the cafe, um, and I got very very depressed. I mean so depressed, you know. I needed medicating yeah. medication and um, and I sold all my climbing gear. I had a room full of climbing gear. Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, ice axes and crampons and, and tents and, and everything. Uh, um, sold all that. I remember crying was when one guy came to buy my to buy my skis and, and my ski mountaineering kit. Um, but but I I realised. Well, I guess I walked a hundred meters around around a building. Yeah. And I, and and I guess I realised well, this wasn't a clinical depression. It was a circumstantial depression. There's a, mm. I'm sure there's a difference. And um, and and I um, I thought. I thought, wow, if if I can walk 100 meters in in nine months, yep, then I can 
then I can walk, then maybe I can walk like 200 metres in 18 months. <laughs> well, well. And maybe um, 400 metres in 36 months or whatever. And yeah. I could maybe get some kind of semblance back of the life that I'd had before. Yeah. There's this little hill in, above my village in Wales and, and, and I really concentrated on that and and it took me three attempts to to um to get up there to, to climb up this kind of 300 meter high hill wow that is and I, so I, cool. I remember just like it was so amazing on on the summit and and um and so you started so, to set little wee goals for yourself that okay i've got uh, I'm, I'm upright i'm walking you know, which was which, yeah. which I I know when you say that you couldn't feed yourself, you couldn't dress yourself. I know what that looks like. I know what it yeah. means to walk a hundred meters, having gone through a journey with with my mum. I know yeah. that yeah. that alone is is the biggest hurdle, like to get to that first hundred meters of walking. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know that that's uh, that's mind blowing when you when you at first can't even sit, you can't even put food in your mouth, little, you know, you can't put your trousers on, you know. um, Mm. So then it does start to compound though, isn't it? Like you you do start to get, you've got a hell of a lot back over the coming, over the years that that ensued, you just got stronger and more focused and more determined. Yeah, and I did, and then pretty much soon after that, I thought I, I remember just looking at it and thinking, well, this is just the longest expedition that I'm ever going <laughs> to be on, you know. It's been a bit, all these, I've been on all these expeditions that lasted kind of three months or whatever, but this is like this is like a kind of lifetime expedition, you know. <laughs> and, that, you know, yeah. that approach, I think, you know, where you've drawn the correlations between your sport and the, 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 the stuff that you learn. Like you, I remember reading uh, somewhere in one of your articles that you learnt patience and long-term determination. Well, oh, yeah, and yeah, you'd, yeah. you'd learnt yeah. that on the wall, basically, climbing, <laughs> because like you say, some of these expeditions up these big walls can take months of preparation and, and planning yeah. and, and an execution. Yeah. And so you'd learnt to fight through, not just through on a daily basis, but to set these massive goals. I remember, um, and it's inevitable, but I'm going to have, you know, have to share a little bit of uh, my mum's story, but I, I, I remember you know, the times of, of absolute desperation and thinking she's never going to get there. But but, but absolute, you, you've got this absolute, this little voice somewhere inside you saying, this is going to be an epic story one day, you know? Yeah. This is, I, yeah. I'm going to show, we're going to show everyone. We're going to, this is going to be an epic comeback. And that was the part of the motivation, I think, like, you know, of, of determination of making this like the longest ultra that we've ever undertaken, yeah. <laughs> and it but makes any yeah. any race that I've done or or anything just pale in comparison to the effort yeah. that went into this. Yeah. So I, I I sort of get that you know, and this was doing it for somebody else. You know, I didn't have to go through it myself, but you know, gr- the the grinding daily, hour by hour, rehabilitation process. Where you can be working for months, eh, Paul, and you see absolutely zilch. <laughs> you don't yeah. see any progress for months, and then all of a sudden you'll get something back. Is that how yeah. it was for you? You know, like you suddenly went, oh, hang bit... on, I can walk 300 metres now. Shit. <laughs> 16 years post injury that I've started to be able to tap my, my, my right foot. Wow. So you're still improving. You know, that's fascinating yeah. to me because, you know, how at the beginning, you know, you're always asking, how long will I improve for? How long will this improvement go? You know, because they're yeah. saying, you, you know, you'll slowly get a little bit of st- something back. Yeah. And, and you, you're sort of looking for this timeline, you know, where, how long or when does it stop? When is it going to stop? And this is going to be me. And you're saying that 16 years later, you've managed to get some muscles working in your foot. In a joint yeah. that must have been almost atrophied, like you know, and, and... That, I think that's the exciting thing about brain injury, right? It's not like a peripheral nerve injury, like a broken back or something, where yeah, where it can't heal, a severed nerve, where you're never really gonna get 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 the yeah get it back. back. But it, but with 
with brain plasticity, you, you, you're, up, you're always going to be, be improving all the time. Yeah. yeah uh, and that's the, maybe that's something that maybe some of your listeners don't understand, don't don't get about brain injury that yeah. No, they don't I mean I've I read a book called The Brain That Heals Itself. I think it was called by Norman Dr. Norman Deutsch because like you yeah. I went you know deep into neuroplasticity and the ability yeah. of the brains because it's only in recent years that scientists have really started to understand that the brain, even as an, in an older adult, can still change and other parts of that brain can take over the role of that dead tissue. Um, yeah. And, and that's the fascinating thing. It, it isn't a fixed... And, and, and this is the same like for, for even for people who haven't had brain injury. If you repeat certain things, you will become good at those, whether they're negative habits or positive habits. Um, and you, you can wear a groove in your mind almost. Um, and you can actually teach it, uh, you know, like with, in my mum's case, her complete spatial awareness was, was taken out. The back of her brain was, was dead, you know, like, so she had no, no balance whatsoever of where she was in the universe. Like where is her, where her body stopped and where it started. And, and so we've had to teach another part of the brain to take over those those faculties if you like yeah. and, and it, yeah. it's taken two years but now it has and, and she's passing driving she's done and she's driving she's walking she's she's you know like she's <laughs> still like you she's like you know like today we did a near kilometer walk you know and that is a massive massive amount of concentration and focus to be able yeah. to walk for that long um yeah and, and, you know, we're fighting age, too, because she's 76. And, of course, you yeah, know, she's yeah, got yeah. a 76-year-old body. And, um, but we've done it, you know. We've, we've come to this amazing place where she's now very nearly independent. I still wouldn't say she's 100% independent because she's at risk of falling. So we have to keep an eye on her at all times. Yeah. But, you know, she has a quality of life that is just phenomenal yeah. compared to the state that she was in and and you must look back at that young Paul in that first year in that rehab and go holy heck I, 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 you didn't know that all this greatness was ahead of you I mean Paul for the listeners out there you're writing your fourth book you've it will, yeah, tell us all the, the crazy expeditions that you've actually done since this injury in the last well, few years and things well after the hill in Wales, I, I then, I then stayed, I then went up a few more hills in Wales, and then I went on three expeditions to Africa, climbing a thousand meters higher each time. Um, so, so to Jebel Tubkal, then then to Mount Kenya, then to Kilimanjaro. So you climbed Kilimanjaro. But, so, <laughs> So Kilimanjaro was seven years post accident. So, it, so it, wow. it, and that was really the, the launch pad then. That was, um, Did that really cause... make you realise that hey, I can actually climb again? I could actually do yeah. all sorts again. Yeah. But how the yeah, hell I mean, do you do that with? Because you still have an impairment today, don't you? You still have. So, like, can you lift your right arm at all, or is that lot side still? No, 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 my right arm's totally paralysed. Um, my leg's totally paralysed, really. It's just um, it, I, I kind of walk on with kind of trickery of the of kind of the, <laughs> the bone, kind of you know. Yeah, you sort of lock it out somehow and put your weight yeah. on it, and then swing the other leg through, or so. Yeah. Wow. Um, but but I um, we get there. We just get there. <laughs> how the hell do you contemplate like for people that you know are able-bodied to contemplate climbing up Kilimanjaro or some of the other things that you're going to tell us about how do you even contemplate that and go like logistically I know how difficult these expeditions are just for someone who's able-bodied to be able to carry all your gear to get to the actual Plymouth start line let alone climbing the actual mountain you know which takes uh, what five or six days or something to get up there doesn't it um, yeah how, yeah. the, how the hell do you do that through jungle, through with one leg that doesn't really work and one arm well, that doesn't yes. work? <laughs> so I'm always prepared to fail. So, so, uh, but if, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, 
it's a it's like a old adage, isn't it? You know, if you don't if you don't if you don't try, then you're never going to get there. So, I, so my first mountain in Africa, I traveled to Calais I, in Morocco. I, I failed on that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so and so I was prepared to I was always prepared to fail on, on Kilimanjaro, but I but um and in fact I even got um, pulmonary edema and I had to go back down and then and then and then I went back up wow. kind of three <laughs> days later and, and, and succeeded. Amazing, yeah. amazing. Because altitude brings a whole raft of other problems. Like yeah, yeah. pulmonary edema or um, and yeah. I've I've had that and I know that that's likely it ain't much fun. <laughs> Where did you get that? Uh, I was trying to do the world's highest marathon ever recorded, um, uh, starting on uh, top of Kalapatar next to Everest. Oh and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, and we were meant to go down uh, back through um, what is it, Gorik Ship, and then over uh, the, the 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 pass and then around a distance of a marathon within a 24-hour period was the goal. And, you know, a year and a half in the preparation film teams, you know, I was doing it with another guy who was an Everest climber and he was very experienced at altitude. I'm an asthmatic, so I I, I don't have a good set of lungs and that's one of the reasons why I I ran so many deserts because I was good in the hot, dry climate. So I was totally outside my comfort zone, but I was like, I want to have a go at something new, you know. And I went up there. I'd done I'd done a 222k race at this altitude the year before in uh, yep. the Indian Himalayas, though on on a on the on a, on a semi road type thing. So I knew that I yeah I'd survived that at altitude. But this one, the temperatures were around the minus 20, and we climbed Kalapatar three days before, and that's I got a I got a lung infection, and then the, the pulmonary edema hit, and I was like six hours before we were meant to start, I had to make that decision to pull out, which was just devastating. Um, oh. You know, like it, it, it took well, it really kicked yeah. my ass, and it did it, it emotionally. Of course, um, it was oh. devastating because you had all you know that that pressure of sponsors and film crews and. I mean, we haven't had the prime yeah. minister on the bloody documentary and stuff. It was, yeah. you know, and then here I am. I failed before I even made the first step. <laughs> but when, so I know, yeah. So altitude it can really knock your ass in. Um, okay. And for you then to still like three days later turn around and still go back up again, that's pretty amazing, especially yeah. considering <laughs> everything. I didn't have a deadline like I didn't have a deadline like you. I could wait for my lungs to stop bubbling and then. <laughs> and then... <laughs> <laughs> Wait for them to to come down again before you had another crack. Yeah, but like, like, how do you physically, like, with one heart, arm, how do you climb? Like, because one of the great things that you did is go back to actual totem pole that 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 stack where you had this major accident in Tasmania. What was it? Eighteen years after the accident, and you actually climbed it again. Yeah. I mean, how? In two thousand sixteen. Yeah. How the hell do you do that with one arm and one leg? Yeah. Well, first of all, so I couldn't, I could never climb it with my hands and my feet like, like, like normal. So, or like, um, like I used to. Yep. So, so, well, I, I make, I go there every year down to Cape Hoy and, and, look, and, and about five years ago, I started thinking, wow, well, maybe I should start, maybe I should think about climbing this. <laughs> thing um, and and but I it took me quite a while to work out how, how I could climb it with yeah. one hand and uh, even a rope so because I knew that I would I knew that I'd have to, I would have to climb a rope up it but the normal way for for climbing a rope is with two hands and two feet yeah this, yep. So I would have to climb with one hand and one foot. So you read um, the system somehow to put to pull yourself one up with one arm and and yeah. step yeah. yourself up through rope the whole the whole way yeah. pretty much. Yeah, and so we we worked it we worked it out that it was um, one hundred and twenty six one arm pull ups. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Crikey, you would have had to yeah. train hard with that one arm to do that. How the hell is that arm yeah. now? Is that that shoulder buggered as well? 
Because that's the other danger, it, of course. It, it was really sore yeah. for about for a number of months after that. Yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. Did you have a fantastic yeah. team of mates too around you in order to be able to do that? Yeah. 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 yeah so I had like um, nine or ten people help carry um, climbing equipment and water and food yeah. and uh, and and um, filming equipment out to the out to the end of the cape wow and yeah and and the guy that led me up it he he was um he had made the first free ascent of the totem pole steve monks yep um but i often say that without that without that rope i liken that rope to kind of my support and without so without that support of that rope and and also all my friends, I would never have been able to to kind of realise a, a long held dream. Yeah. It, it, so it, I think that with support, people are people people are really capable of 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 great things. I mean, and not just not just disabled people, but able bodied people too. Yeah. So I'm a great believer in in kind of helping each other <laughs> oh yeah and, and it is so yeah. i think when you when you like as a, as a coach when you get alongside someone and you give their dreams wings and you say yeah when everyone else is saying who the what the hell you can't do that you know we've all been told we can't do stuff you know and, and i've never let that that stop me doing stuff you know like and i've failed and i've crashed and burned and you know and people yeah. have been proven right before but they've also been proven wrong yeah. many a time and it's when you get a, a mate alongside you or a team of mates that can yeah. say yeah we we believe in your silly dream and we're going to help you get there uh yeah. and when you do that you give wings to people's dreams and they they achieve far more than what they would ever have done on their own because somebody believed yeah. in them and somebody backed them and this is the thing with a with a rehab journey like like yours or like with with my mum, yeah. um, having that person going, nah, this is the way forward. This is where we're going, and we're going together." It's just such a huge piece of the puzzle, yeah. I think. Yeah, but I think it's it's obviously even worse for disabled people because they're not or people with disabilities. They they they're actually told what they. What they're allowed to do, what they mm. can and can't do, or what you know, it's it, they've got. All, some people have got no um, autonomy. It's, and that's so and it's, so horrible to see, isn't it? It just yeah, it, yeah. It, and I've been in that position. Yeah. Mm. How did you cope? Because that was one of the things that I was determined uh, with my mum. They said you have to put her in a home. She's never going to do this, and I just wanted her out of that institution i wanted her out of the hospital i wanted her out i did not want to be put in an institution and and I, she was hospital level care and they said well you'll never cope yeah. you will not cope but i was determined that because when you are when that autonomy is taken away when the power of your life is taken away what on earth are you fighting to live for you've got nothing you have no right uh -huh. to make a decision over your life. And that's for me is just, I know she had no ability to make any decisions at that stage. But for me, being surrounded by loved ones and in your family home yeah. is a big part of that recovery. You know, yeah. you're going to come back. You're going to come back because you're in a place where you want to be and you feel loved and you feel supported and mm. you feel there's something to fight for. There's not a hell of a lot to fight for when you're shoved away or you, you, your autonomy is completely taken over. Um, and, yeah, and when you were in those institutions, you know, there is, you know, there, you don't have any say of what you eat, what you watch, what you, nothing. You know, and that's no. just, I don't know. I would find that um, extremely hard if it was me. So last year, last year we were, me and four, dis four other disabled people, um, we rode from the lowest point in Australia to the highest point from from Katitanda or Lake Eyre to, to Mount Kosciuszko. Wow! And um, it, it took forty three days. I was on a I was on a a tandem tricycle with 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 a blind guy <laughs> on the back, 
38% uh, lung function through, due to cystic fibrosis. Yeah. Another guy who couldn't, who, who was paraplegic and uh, on a hand cycle. What a, um, what a picture you guys must have made. What a wonderful picture. <laughs> um, 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 but we, that was all about challenging misconceptions about what say people with disabilities are allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do. You know, we we, we organised ourselves and we and we okay we we were all fairly high functioning disabled people. You know, but uh, but we we um we made a point of kind of you know it was it, it was a dis disability led kind of um, um, expedition. Oh, you know, and, and, yeah. Yeah, I think it was. I think that's fantastic because it just does show, and, it, and it's such a role model and inspiration to other people who are fighting through their own uh, problems, whether you know, like in physical disabilities or or even other challenges in life. That crikey, if they can do that with with those problems, and they just yeah. with with massive amounts of determination and fight can overcome so much. Then maybe yeah. I can I can deal with my little situation in my life and 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 you know that uh, I had a, a, dear, a very dear friend Samuel Gibson who had uh, osteogenesis imperfecta which is a brittle bones disease and he only grew to like three foot tall and and he was confined to a wheelchair and you know his his bones would he had hundreds of broken bones in his life and he never grew very very big and he was stuck in yeah. a wheelchair but he was the biggest he had the heart of a lion you know he had the heart. Oh, you know, he he sailed um, single-handedly on a in a yacht to cross the Cook Strait. He he uh, <laughs> skied down a mountain yeah. with you know with a guide. Yeah. He he uh, backpacked around Central Asia. And married a, a a nurse, a lovely lady. They had two children, despite his uh, having to you know having having um, uh, specialist gene. Uh, experts check out the the genes and all the rest of it. He overcame all those things and had two beautiful girls. And then we were we were doing a planning an expedition together to do a three hundred and thirty k race where I was going to be running along with uh, my husband and a friend, and and Samuel was going to be in the wheelchair rolling along beside us. You know, which you know, across trails and all sorts of terrain, and that was going to be a massive thing. So he was training for this event when he. He did a half marathon in the Hawke's Bay, and and, and tragedy struck. He, he um, was catapulted. His his chair failed, and he was catapulted out of his chair, and he um, hit his head, and and the brain injuries were so severe that he that he that he didn't make it, um, which was a, a huge loss to us all because he was just uh -oh. an incredible man that he had never let any of those disabilities stop him living a, a full and amazing life. Um, and, and we actually, uh, last year, we ran across the North Island from his, his parents' home to his wife's and where he lived, right across the North Island in honour of him and to, yeah, yeah. and to raise money for other people with disabilities so that they could yeah. live their dreams. And we took my mum, who at that stage was still very fragile, still in a wheelchair, and it was her dream to crew for me once more because she'd always crewed for me. And so she, oh, okay. so she got to crew on this, this expedition across the North Island. And we had, uh, you know, wonderful help from caregivers and stuff to, to help us do that. And it, it fulfilled, you know, like it was such a tragic loss that we lost Samuel, but we started this, this trust. We, we raised a heck of a lot of money and we had my mum there yeah. and it was just a celebration of, of Samuel's life of, my mum's still being with us and we're still fighting and, and, you know, the athleticness yeah. of having to run across the North Island. And it, it was, uh, yeah. you know, these things, uh, they might seem silly and pointless to other people when we go and do these crazy expeditions or, or come up with some random idea to go across Australia <laughs> in, a, in yeah. a recumbent uh, tandem bicycle or whatever, <laughs> yeah. but they're not because this is where this is where the edge of humanity, like we um, are pushing the limits of what's possible for people with disabilities or what's possible for humanity in general, and we're pioneers, you know. And yeah, exactly, yeah. I think this Because quite a lot of people think, quite a lot of people think that um, 
these challenges are, are not that they're, they're just um stupid superfluous. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, silly, don't they? Yeah. And they, yeah. they think even that about uh I had a comment on one of my videos uh running through Death Valley and someone commented on it, some idiot. <laughs> um Oh, it just shows it, it, I have no respect for the people that do this. This is just completely stupid. It's just another typical thing of people trying to prove themselves and doing something ridiculous or something like that, they said. And I thought, you just don't get the spirit of oh. of, of, of what, oh. and what you learn, you know, when you, when you push outside your comfort zone and yeah. when you fight against yourself, you become a person – that can it is resilient. I mean, look at you. You you had the most worst injury of that you could possibly imagine, the longest rehabilitation, and you are still strong, focused, happy, determined, and had had a crazy life because well, you didn't what, give up. Oh, what my friend Duncan, who was who was behind me on the tandem, the blind guy, what he 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 um uh, thinks that. And I and I tend to agree that 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 uh, our disabilities have, uh, have made us. We've had to we've had to cope with with hardship every yeah. every day of our lives, and and it and it's and it means that we are we are more resilient than than than, than anyone. Than, than you know, than than the normal person who who is who is um who is completely able bodied and fit, you know. Oh, and, absolutely, and that yeah. that mind means that you having that mindset means that you can tackle stuff that people cannot comprehend, and you will fight, and you won't give up, and you you're resilient. That you know that is the true nature of 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 resilience, really, and. None of us really would yeah. wish to go through these horrible things, but let's take the best out of it that we can take away from it and make ourselves stronger from it, you know, at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. well, I've, I always say that my, 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 my injury was the best thing that has ever happened to me, and, that's, and I, <laughs> I stand by that, you know. That's amazing because, you, you know, you would have been to hell and back and you still would say that. You know, that that's incredible. Because I've been because I've been telling back, yeah. <laughs> and you're now you can face down any fear and any confidence issue and any you know, anything really. Because nothing's gonna yeah. be that bad again, is it? <laughs> <laughs> that's one way of looking at it. I've been through the worst. What else have you got to throw at me, you know? <laughs> Yeah. I sort of think. Hey, look, Paul, yeah. you've been an absolute wonderful guest today. I know um, you said to me earlier you, you struggle uh, with your words, finding your words, uh, but I think you're extremely eloquent in, in expressing the important things that, that – and you're a wonderful uh, writer. So if people want to read Paul's books, can you list off your books that you have and you've got a new one coming out soon? Um, so, that, yeah, well, where uh, people can find you? Uh, I'm just about to republish the totem pole, which is my, the story of my accident on the totem pole, but, um, and and but basically, all, all my books. If you go to my website, um, paulpritchard.com.au, then mm -hmm. then um, paulpritchard.com.au. So Pritchard is P-R-I-T-C-H-A-R-D. Is that right? Yes. Pritchard. Yeah. dot com dot au people yeah, and th there they will be able to find your books yes yes and um that's probably the best way to go because you've won prizes too with your books haven't you so your earlier books before the accident what was in that title of that that one yeah so the book that I wrote in 1997 won one the one um the Boardman Tasker Prize, it's called. It's like the the, the Mountaineers Booker Prize, I guess. Wow. And then, yeah. And then, um, and then the Totem Pole won won that prize again. Oh wow! <laughs> the, first, the first time that they'd done the double, and then and that 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 book won the won the uh, Banff Mountain Literature Prize as well. Wow, that is high yeah. praise indeed. 
So those are the three books. Uh, and the totem pole is being rewritten. Have you put any of your later insights into it as well? No, I'm, I am. Um, it's going to be a totally new new edition, though. With with um, mm -hmm. it's got it's mm -hmm. got it's got a forward by Conrad Anker and um, and and um, a new preface and and fifty pictures throughout the text instead of instead of kind of yep just sixteen. A... Oh, fantastic. In the middle of it, you know, so, you know, yeah. so well worth a read to read that incredibly inspiring story. Yeah. So .com au people, if you want to get hold of Paul or you want to reach out to him, I'm sure you'll be happy to to um, talk to anybody who's listened to this podcast because, you know, it's people like you that, that make a difference in the world and I don't care if anyone calls you crazy. I think you're absolutely amazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so keep fighting, mate, and, and um, I'll be interested to hear what your next crazy mission is. <laughs> I'm no, no crazier than you, mate, I don't think. I'm, a, I'm having a break from the craziness while I concentrate <laughs> on my mum at the moment, but no doubt there'll be some other stupidity in my future, I hope. <laughs> Yeah. so thanks very much Paul for coming on the show today that's it for this episode of Pushing the Limits with your host Lisa Tamati please don't forget to rate, review and subscribe and share all this goodness with your networks so we can impact more lives with positive insights and inspiring conversations and check us out online at www.lisatamati.co.nz